Jack, 40s, makes coffee as his young daughters Katie, 10, and Amy, 8, eat breakfast. Jack grabs the mail and flips through it. Jack, Bill, Bill, junk, ooh, a coupon. What's this? Jack pulls out an envelope with no return address. He opens it and pulls out a handwritten note. Dear neighbor, I must apologize for my behavior these past few years. The constant arguments, loud noises, and overall tension have gone too far. I wish to make amends and invite you and your family to dinner this Saturday at 7 p.m. to discuss moving forward in a more positive manner. No pressures or obligations, but I hope we can find a way to coexist peacefully. Please consider an RSVP by Thursday. Your neighbor, Chris Jack, is puzzled and a bit skeptical, but hands the note to Katie. Katie, Dad, this is so weird. Chris is the crazy neighbor everyone talks about. Amy, I don't want to go. He'll probably poison us. Katie, yeah. Remember when he threw that rock through our window last Halloween? Jack, girls, calm down. I know he's been difficult, but maybe he really does want to bury the hatchet. Oh, it could be a chance to solve our problems once and for all. Katie and Amy look unsure, but don't argue further. Jack sighs and rubs his face, conflicted about what to do. Chris's house. Night Chris, also in his 40s, sits alone nursing in a beer watching a baseball game. He hears laughter outside and peeks through the blinds. It's Jack, Katie, and Amy playing in their yard. Chris cracks a small smile, but it quickly turns bitter. He downs the rest of his beer in one gulp. Chris, guess my olive branch didn't work, Jack. Fine, have it your way. It's back to war, then. Chris grabs another beer, and his expression darkens with determination and misplaced vengeance. Jack's house, night. Jack puts the girls to his shed deep in thought. He peers out the window at Chris's house, light still on. Jack sighs heavily, worried about escalating tensions, but also wanting to give peace a chance. He pulls out his cell and sends a text. Neighborhood. Morning. Jack and Chris stand in Chris's driveway, facing each other, both a bit on edge. Katie and Amy watch warily from the window. Jack got your text, said we needed to talk. So, talk. Chris. I meant what I said in the note. I'm tired of the fighting. It's getting us nowhere. Let's start over. Be neighborly, instead of always at each other's throats. Jack. Skeptical. And what changed your mind after all these years, Chris? Let's just say... I had an epiphany. Realized how petty and toxic things had gotten. Life's too short to waste it feuding, you know. Jack examines Chris's face, searching for signs of deception or aggression. But Chris seems genuinely remorseful. Jack. All right. I'm willing to try if you are. Truce? Chris smiles, the first genuine smile Jack has ever seen from him, and extends his hand. Jack hesitates briefly, then shakes it firmly. The girls peek out and smile shyly at each other, a glimmer of hope lighting their faces. Chris. Thank you, Jack. Now how about that dinner, this Saturday at seven? I'll cook up a real feast. Jack nods with a small smile, tension slowly leaving his shoulders. Across the street, the neighbor Miss Carter, 80s, peers through her blinds, worried yet hopeful the men have found peace. Chris's house, Saturday. Chris puts the finishing touches on an extravagant barbecue spread. Doorbell rings. It's Jack, Katie, and Amy. Chris greets them warmly. Chris, welcome. Come in, come in. Food's almost ready. Have a seat. Kids, there's soda in the fridge. Help yourselves. The kids tentatively get sodas and sit at the table watching Chris and Jack, still a bit on edge. Chris focuses on being a gracious host, keeping conversation light. The food is amazing and starts to ease tensions. When plates are cleaned, Chris proposes a toast. Chris, to new beginnings and goodwill between neighbors. 
May our street find unity instead of strife from this day on. They clink glasses and drink. Jack and the kids begin to relax, seeing Chris has truly changed. Miss Carter watches through the window, joyful tears in her eyes. Peace has come at last. Or has it? Chris sets down his glass, eyes darkening as he produces. A handgun. He cocks it with a sinister grin. Chris. The truth is, I never stopped wanting revenge, Jack. All of this was just to lure you into a false sense of security. Jack and the terrified kids raise their hands slowly. Chris laughs maniacally and collapses face down onto the table. Panicked, Jack rushes to Chris and checks his pulse. Nothing. He searches frantically for clues as to what happened. That's when he spots an empty poison bottle under the table. Just then, police sirens approaching. Miss Carter must have called 911 when she saw Chris pull the gun. Doors bust open and officers storm in with weapons drawn. One checks Chris and confirms he's dead. Police Officer Ocho One. Looks like your psycho neighbor finally got himself, but who poisoned him? Jack and the kids look around in stunned horror and disbelief, not comprehending how the night went so wrong. The thriller has only just begun. Neighbor Wars Police Station, Night Jack and his family, give statements to Detective Gray, a veteran officer. He seems to believe their story, but must conduct a thorough investigation. Detective Gray. You say Chris was making amends, being welcoming. But something must have set him off right before he died. Did you see or hear anything suspicious? Jack shakes his head, still in shock. Katie speaks up hesitantly. Katie, when we first got there, I thought I heard someone moving around in the bushes by the front window, but when I looked closer, nothing was there. Detective Gray makes a note, intrigued by this small detail, then turns to Amy. Detective Gray, and you, Amy, see or hear anything else out of the ordinary? Amy, no, except when Chris was doing his toast, I thought his drink tasted funny. Kind of bitter. A light bulb goes off for Detective Gray. He thanks them and promises to keep them updated on any leads. But it's clear he now has a promising starting point for his investigation. Neighborhood. Night. Jack drives the girls home. All of them peek out the windows fearfully at the houses they pass. When they pull up, yellow crime scene tape now surrounds their property. Jack parks shakily, puts a brave face on, and walks over to Detective Gray, who's examining their yard with a magnifying glass. He points to shoe prints leading away from the bushes. Detective Gray got some clues. Whoever was lurking came from here, not Chris's place. They clearly meant to frame you as the murderer, but it seems their own poison backfired. Jack is stunned to understand all this happened right outside his own home. His haven is now a crime scene. Who dared target his family and why? Jack's house. Night after a long interview, Detective Gray finally leaves to continue the dig. Jack locks up tight, not that it matters. Clearly an intruder got in before. He pours himself several drinks, mentally and emotionally drained. A creak on the stairs. The girls appear, shaking with fear. Jack pulls them close, hiding his own panic to put on a stern protector front. Jack, girls, it's gone be okay, but from now on you must always stay close to where I can see you. Don't answer the door for anyone till this is solved, understand? I'm not taking any chances. They nodded tearfully into his shirt. Jack steals his nerves, determined to keep his family safe no matter what. But out in the darkness, eyes are watching, waiting for their next move. Police station. Day Detective Gray pours over files and evidence, seeking the key that unravels it all. He rubs tired eyes, wishing his career didn't always involve putting puzzle pieces together after tragedy has already struck. A knock. It's Jack with Gray. Jack, come in. Have a seat. Any news on your end? Jack sighs, clearly exhausted from lack of sleep and stress. Jack, no, just trying to keep the girls calm, but they're terrified. I just don't understand who'd want to hurt us, or 
Why frame me for Chris's death? We barely interacted with the neighbors kept to ourselves. Gray nods thoughtfully, tapping a pen against his chin. Gray. Well, I dug a bit deeper into Chris's history, hoping for a motive. Turns out before moving here five years ago, he had some trouble back in his hometown. Petty crimes, bar fights, restraining orders from past relationships gone bad. My guess is he brought his toxic behavior with him, and it finally caught up to him. Jack. You think one of his old enemies found him and did this, but why target my family too? Gray. That's what I'm still trying to figure. One thing is clear. Whoever is responsible clearly wanted us, thinking you were the murderer. They went to great lengths to set the stage. My guess is Chris had another enemy we don't know about yet. Someone holding a grudge who views you as collateral damage. For now, I'd advise. Just then, Gray's desk phone rings urgently. He answers, face turning grave as he listens. Hanging up, he turns to Jack. Gray, we may have our first real lead. Just got a 911 call about a disturbance at Miss Carter's house. She's your other neighbor, right? Let's go. Jack. Oh God, please let her be okay. Worry and apprehension grip Jack as they rush out, praying the elderly woman hasn't become the mystery assailant's next target. But will they get there in time? Miss Carter's house. Day police cruisers screech up, Jack and Gray leaping out with guns drawn. They approach cautiously. Front door ajar. From inside, a scuffle and grunting, followed by three gunshots. Adrenaline surging, they burst inside to find... Miss Carter standing over an intruder clutching a shotgun, looking dazed but unharmed. The intruder screams in agony, clutching a bleeding leg wound. Gray. Get an ambulance now. Ma'am, are you hurt? What happened? Miss Carter, I... I was in the kitchen when he broke in. Said he was looking for something, but I didn't understand. Then he pulled a knife, so I shot him. I'm sorry I just wanted to live. Jack. It's okay, Miss Carter, you did good. You're safe now. Gray cuffs the moaning intruder as more units arrive. An ambulance takes him away. It seems their elusive criminal has finally slipped up, but the bomb is only just beginning to explode. Police Interrogation Room, Day Detective Gray grills the weaseled intruder, whose leg wound has been treated. Gray All right, buddy, you gone to play tough? We'll just keep you on an attempted murder charge for now. But I know you played a role in the death of Chris and the attempts on Jack's family. So start talking or it's gone to get a lot worse really quick. Weaseled sighs shakily, breaking under the pressure. Weaseled. All right. Just keep me out. Talk the gas chamber, all right? Name's Ronnie. Used to run with Chris back in our hometown. He ratted me out on an old drug charge. Got me five extra years in the pen. Swore when I got out, I'd make him pay. Gray. So, you followed him here and what? Just waited for the right moment? Ronnie. Now. Man. Soon as I found him, I started hassling him. Petty crap, like keying his car. But he wasn't rolling enough, so I stepped it up. Followed him one night, got in a fight, smashed his head on the pavement. Made it look accidental, but he survived. Doc said one harder hit, though, and next time he wouldn't wake up. Gray scribbles furiously, piecing it together. Gray. So, when he reached out to make amends with Jack, you saw your chance. Poisoned Chris's drink at the dinner and tried framing Jack to cover your tracks. Ronnie nods shamelessly. Ronnie. Figured with Jack in jail, I'd be long gone by the time forensics proved otherwise. But then the old lady had to go be a hero and foil my score settling. Guess it's the needle for me now, detective. You won fair and square. Gray has heard enough, slamming the file shut in disgust. Justice is served, lives are saved, and the neighborhood can finally breathe easy once more. Jack and his family begin their long road to find peace again. As Gray exits, the cells slam shut on Ronnie with an air of bitter finality. The saga of neighbor wars has come to an end.